there was one moment that there was a uh, breaking up audio. So hopefully, uh, you watching online can now hear more clearly. So, we're nail in the coffin for California's aquatic ecosystems. And that's because this issue that I'm talking about isn't really just about aquatic snakes and non native snakes that are used in California, but more about their potential impact and the opportunity for us to do something about it before they become more widely established and get uh, yet more to the declines we've seen with a lot of our native freshwater uh, amphibians and, and inland fishes. Uh, collaborators. Uh, first person on the left, Jonathan Rose, is one of my graduate students at UC Davis, and he's been really instrumental in conducting, carrying out a lot of this work, uh, and he and I are, have worked quite closely on these projects that we're going to describe to you today. Steve Wilson, who works in the southeast and who has also been involved in some of this research here in California, and Bob Reed with the U.S. Geological Survey, who uh, was the first person to tip me off to this issue when I moved to California, and actually led the project down in Harbor City that I'll, I'll just talk a little bit about today. To begin, I want to give you an overview of, of the issues that I'm going to be talking about here today. And so uh, I want to describe sort of the state of California's aquatic species and then talk about invasive species in aquatic systems here in California and part of the facilitation that we've seen uh, in support of those invasive species. Uh, a little more broadly about the effects of invasive species globally. I'm going to start talking about the natural history of the water snakes that we're going to be mainly focusing on today. Uh, describe their status in parts of California, describe process that takes place when any animal is introduced to an area if it becomes successfully in, in, invasive in that new habitat, and then talk about the work that we've done that describes, uh, that projects the potential invasion risk of this species, as well as tries to identify some of the risk to native amphibians and inland fishes and uh, some potential competing native gar snakes. Future steps that we're doing with our work starting mostly this year uh, and discuss how you can be involved uh, members of the public or even as uh, staff members of the uh, California Department of Fish and Wildlife. Again, uh, to, to broader framework, I want to talk about sort of the status of uh, California's native aquatic species. That came out about four years ago now, uh, done by a colleague of mine in my department at UC Davis. And it was an assessment of the native inland fishes, that is the non-anadromous uh, non fish, and uh, includes many of the non-game freshwater fish species. Pie chart to the left was that about 75% of our native inland fishes are at some risk of extinction, whether they're near threatened, vulnerable, uh, or in some cases have already gone extinct. When they those data a little more more finely, and they looked at what was happening across the decades, you can see in the graph to the bottom right, the percentage of inland fishes that are in reasonably secure shape has actually shrunk over the last 30 or 40 years. And in we've seen the number of species of special concern grow, as well as ESA listed uh, species. And here they focused more on some of the anadromous species and other salmonids in clubhead and trout, the is actually even more dire. As 90% of the fish of the salmonids native to California are near threatened, vulnerable, endangered, or have already been lost in our watersheds, with only 3% of them in, in relatively uh, fine shape or in secure, at least concerned shape. native species doesn't apply just to the fishes, but it's also been shown to uh, apply to a lot of our uh, pond breeding, aquatic associated amphibians here in California. Uh, a professor at UC Davis, Brad Schaefer, published this older study in the 1990s, um, where he and one of his students at the time lines of amphibians in California's Central Valley area and found that many of the amphibian species were becoming far less common and distinct from previously known locations. Amphibians, and when you look at the status of our native amphibian and reptile species, for amphibians, it's, it's particularly uh, concerning. Aquatic 
associated than are the reptiles, and almost one half of them are either species of special concern or they're actually protected by state or federal law because they're listed as threatened or endangered. Reptiles fall into those categories. Now, native freshwater species have occurred as a result of habitat loss, and in particular, we've seen that the effects of dinging through most of the rivers in California has really changed the hydrology and the water flow of many of the systems in which these species evolved and in which these species are adapted. So, a graph of um, the Bryant Dam on the San Joaquin River. And on the line, you can see what would have been a natural or unregulated historic flow. And that's typified by relatively low flows through parts of the year, but a big pulse of, of um, flow through the river starting in the spring and going through the early summer, usually as it is draining a lot of the snowmelt fed systems upstream higher in the Sierra. In most of our regulated rivers downstream of dams, we have this, this shown by this red line, which generally have very low flows year round because they are regulated for other needs here in the state. <clears throat> and there's a lot of those native fish species that are adapted to those historic natural flow regimes, and in we have facilitated the uh, the invasion of a lot of non-native species, and these are species from the eastern United States, which had a more uh, standard um, uniform distribution of flow in many of their rivers. Another research project that was done by Peter Moyle in my department at UC Davis. In 2000, the Monte Dam underwent a change in their accord that required them to, to regulate the downstream uh, flow, water flow so that it better reflected the natural uh, hydro, hydrographs heard historically. And they change those water flows, and what you see is that at sampling conducted downstream from the dam, by the river kilometer 0, 6, 16, so forth, um, the dark gray shaded bar is with the regulated flow prior to the new accord going into place. And the right side of each of these graphs in the white area is showing you after a more natural regime was uh, recreated with the new accord going into place. On each of these on the left hand side is the proportion of native species that they found in their sampling of, in, of uh, freshwater fishes. And what you notice is that for many of the sampling stations, particularly closer to the dam, when they reverted to a more natural flow regime, it did well to restore the native freshwater fish fauna and fewer invasive species that were found. Now, when you got farther away from the dam, and the, uh, the uh, flow of the dam that was being restored to a more natural uh, region no longer had such an impact because of other tributaries uh, flowing in. In Northern California, along the Trinity River system, but in this case, we're looking at amphibian fauna. This is a modified river system downstream from the uh, Lewiston Reservoir, and what we found was that in this highly modified and regulated flow that doesn't really mimic natural flows, the closer they got to the dam, that is, the more they got to the unnatural flow, the higher the proportion of invasive, non-native American bullfrogs they found, whereas when they got farther away from the dam, where more tributaries contributing to the, uh, the natural flow because they were unregulated, you tend to see fewer invasive species as well as a greater proportion of native amphibians. Cause problems for, for several reasons. Uh, I'm more concerned about their potential impact as new competitors in systems to which they're introduced. So they're be fighting for resources with some of our native species and out competing them, which is a concern. Uh, more, we're worried about them eating some of our native species, and that's something that we'll talk about a little bit today. Uh, invasive species can become new types of prey for native predators and can cause problems. Several non-native catfish around parts of the Central Valley and uh, our state and federally endangered or threatened giant otter snake actually can die in many cases when it eats these catfish because the spines get stuck in its throat. 
case of plants in particular, we see that those introductions and eventual establishment and spread of those plants can cause can change in the vegetation communities, alteration of habitat structure, which can affect many of the native species, and this can lead to changes in ecosystem structure or function. As to whether invasive species actually cause extinctions, uh, we can have this suite of negative impacts on native species, but it, it's been unclear the extent to which they can actually drive native species to extinction. So this is an older paper now, but it was one of the first reviews published in 2004 that was trying to address this question as to how likely is it that native species actually get driven extinct from the interest of non-native invasive species. It's alien predators and disease-causing pathogens that are introduced into areas that generally are supported by the data as driving species to extinction. They so a lot of notable examples of several predatory snakes that when introduced to areas can, uh, can cause almost a complete collapse of native um, With it is that of the brown tree snake introduced into Guam. The native of Indonesia, Papua New Guinea, and Eastern Australia. But around World War II, it was introduced into Guam, probably accidentally, as American troops and others were moving uh, um, uh, around and uh, shipments and supplies. But action. It took about 20 or 30 years for that species to become very well established and entrenched in Guam. What we saw was the near complete collapse of native fauna. There are all bird species, and their abundance is shown on the y axis, and the year is shown on the x axis along the bottom. And what we see is that for the vast majority of these birds, they were quickly driven extinct in the span of about 10 years, starting about 25 or 30 years after the brown tree snake had been introduced. Snake populations grew, they finally reached a level at which they were causing impacts to native species. Now, many species are extinct. Native mammals have also disappeared, and some of the native lizards have all disappeared. All these groups, primarily because they have been eaten, they serve as prey by this non native and introduced brown tree snake. One of the stories that's been making the headlines here in the United States in the last five to ten years has been that of the Burmese python. The Burmese, uh, as you can see in these photographs here, can reach pretty good, pretty good lengths, pretty big size. It can often be a top predator. Uh, you can see in the bottom right photograph, this is an image of a Burmese python that has eaten an alligator and couldn't stomach the meal, and it actually exploded because the alligator was so large and, and perhaps still alive. You see a small deer in the bottom left, and sometimes even eaten by some of the native species in the top uh, top left. Uh, we're presumably introduced sometime around the late 1980s. It's a little unclear uh, exactly what the intent was of the release, whether they were accidental, intentional, the uh, byproduct of a uh, hurricane. But it looks like they were brought here for the pet trade. They, they have been occasional pets. Um, and one way they were introduced into Everglades National Park relatively unnoticed for the first five to ten years, but starting in the mid-90s, captures of them and observations of them by park wardens as well as and research biologists really started to rise exponentially to the point by the early 2000s they were quite prevalent and easily found along roads in many of the uh, parts of Everglades National Park. Tried looking at what's going on with the uh, native community of animals around the same time that these Burmese pythons were becoming much more widespread and prevalent. Actually, rather shocking. Now, that's correlational and not necessarily cause and effect, but it paints a pretty stark picture. In addition to this figure, figure A, the green is showing you the number of animals in each of these different categories that were seen in 1996 and 1997 by people who have driven a total of about 6,500 kilometers along roads in Everglades National Park. A decade later, after the, the um, 
Python had become more widespread, the, the number of animals in each of these different categories that were seen with 60, nearly 60,000 kilometers of driving, so complete collapse of a lot of the mammals in the Everglades National Park. Now, in the lower part of this figure, uh, part B, we display of the number of animals along the y-axis in each category shown in the x-axis. The red areas, the red bars, are showing you deep within the core of where the Burmese python is well established. Just toward the edge of where Burmese pythons are established, and so you start to see more uh, mammals. And then the lightest colored bar, the yellow or, or beige colored bar, is showing you outside of the range of where we know Burmese pythons now occur, where we do see quite a few mammals in the community still. That they found that there was almost a 100%, 9.3% decrease in the frequency of raccoons that are seen on roads. Decrease the number of opossums, 87.5% decrease the number of bobcats, and then they failed to find any rabbits despite 56,900 kilometers of driving along roads looking for these animals. This has captivated a lot of uh, America, or at least the media, and I think that's driven in part by the fact that there is something very impressive about a snake that's as long as three people. Contrast, when you shift gears to our little introduced snake here, we have the size of three of these snakes. And it's maybe a little less fearsome, but I think the point here is that uh, for the reasons I'll talk about today, we should still pay attention to what's happening in our native ecosystems and maybe think about the impacts of this potentially invasive and certainly introduced and established not our snake here in California. natural history of water snakes to give you an idea of, of, of who they are and how they make their living and why they have any interest in, in uh, what they could do to California's native fauna. But by their common name, the water snakes are highly aquatic, if not entirely aquatic, uh, group of species. And different species, uh, these are largely from my colleague J.D. Wilson, found only east of the Rocky Mountains. So they are a specifically eastern North American clade of snakes. There are in total in the genus Nerodia. The area on this graph is showing you the higher densities or of species, greater number of species. And over to the Atlantic coast and actually all the way up into Canada. predators, and they are really essentially called dietary generalists. But because of the fact that they are highly aquatic, they are eating whatever they can catch in and around aquatic areas. Most of them are feeding on fish, as you see here in the bottom left, uh, and also feeding on a lot of amphibians, as you see here in the bottom right, as one of these water snakes devours a salamander. Uh, by the word viviparous here. And they can be highly fecund. They have as many as up to 100 uh, offspring of litter. You can see the right photograph, uh, one of the females is giving birth. And then the photographs on the bottom left, they're showing uh, some necropsies that we did on animals that we captured. And each one of those little embryos is essentially a developing fetus or a developing embryo um, of uh, a baby water snake inside other. Generally, so about 20 to 40 offspring. Spring, uh, each litter. And they're giving birth usually every year uh, and typically only once a year. A handful of introductions of these species into California. Now, it's not clear exactly uh, how, why, or, or when they were introduced. They uh, are common in the pet trade. We do see them occasionally. Uh, they're not known for being very friendly animals to have as pets, and so I, I can easily envision that people who have these might just get tired of being bitten or bitted upon, and they release these animals. Um, but it's really not clear exactly where they came from. They certainly didn't get here naturally. They were brought here by us one way or another. Or reports in the literature of any sign of these water snakes in California in 1976. Of Nerodia fasciata, it was seen in LA County. 
uh, a report of the diamond-backed water snake, Nodia rhombifer, found in the Lafayette Reservoir over near Berkeley in Contra Costa County. Southern water snakes in Seattle County, specifically in Fulton, since 1992. Since we've had some idea that there was another population in LA County in Harbor City. And then the northern water snake has been known since at least 2007 in Placer County, specifically in the city of Roseville. Or population, but the individuals seen in 1976 didn't really seem to comprise a big population. They went unnoticed and were never really found again. And we think that the population found in 2006 in LA County is probably a different population, a separate introduction in a different part of Los Angeles County. And water snake seen in the 1980s, um, despite extensive searching in the late 90s and early 2000s, apparently disappeared. It went uh, locally extinct and has not been seen in about 10 or 15 years. Three populations suspected to occur here in California of two species, the southern water snake, Nerodia fasciata, and the uh, common water snake, Nerodia sipipidon. are on a map just to give you an idea of, of the, the two species we're talking about, uh, the timeline and the three different areas uh, where they have occurred, at least in recent years. These introductions or observations occurred prior to 2008, and in the California Department of Fish and Wildlife, back then the Department of Fish and Game, actually decided to place this of water snakes as uh, a restricted species under their game code. Um, they are prohibited from take, possession, sale, transport, ownership. You basically cannot have these animals in your possession here in California. And that rule has been in place since 2008. That rule really promulgated by the, aware, the, the recent awareness of some of these populations leading up to 2008, as well as a lot of concerns about the impacts that these water snakes might have on our endangered uh, uh, fauna here in the state. of the uh, native freshwater amphibians, uh, freshwater fishes, um, can potentially serve as prey for these water snakes. But another group that we're starting to think about is native garter snakes here in California. So they're actually closely related to the water snakes. They are sister taxa, if you will. They're live bearers. They behave somewhat similarly. Many are highly aquatic. They have the same prey. They share a lot of the same habitat. Uh, but because water snakes do not occur west of the Rockies, we have snakes as our dominant aquatic species in California. In fact, their highest diversity is here in the state, where we have eight different species. And the distribution of six of those species shown here with the corresponding color code on the map. So busy with the triangle and the two stars, the three populations of the non-native water snakes that we are uh, concerned about. of garter snakes in this Thamnophis here in California. We have two state and federally listed species. In the bottom left, we have the endangered San Francisco garter snake found on the San Francisco Peninsula south of the city. And in parts of the Central Valley, we still have remnant populations of this threatened species, the giant garter snake. We're quite concerned about. You can see here the, the distribution or the range of the giant garter snake shown here in green as all the known observations of giant garter snakes shown with the black plus sign. You can also see with the blue triangle and the red star the near locations of these two different species of water snakes, one in Wilson, known from 92, again, and then one in Roseville, known from 2007. And the population is only 13 kilometers from known giant garter snake populations. And of course, we're deeply worried about this water snake eventually making its way through our highly connected, integrated waterways and canal systems into deeper into the tat and distribution of giant garter snakes, where it might do quite well feeding on eastern fish species and eastern amphibians like bullfrogs that occur here and compete and actually drive further declines of this uh, threatened state-threatened giant garter snake. 
step back and take a little broader picture to talk about what the processes of invasion ecology are so that I can help you identify where in this framework we address our research attention. Invasion starts with a pool of native species. And transport, usually uh, unintentional, sometimes intentional, but the vast majority of the time driven by humans. Takes those animals to new areas where they are not native and results in an introduction in many cases. <clears throat> the majority of the introductions fail, fortunately for us, because they can be quite costly. But for those that do not fail, the animals are becoming established in these new areas, in these new parts, outside of their native range. After entrenched and well established, we start to worry about the dispersal and spread of these non native species. Native habitats, we start to worry about impacts to native ecosystems and the species therein. Where we start to realize that we're going to have to think about a new future where we integrate that species into our community and recognize it as a new member that is shaping the way our species are interacting and the way our ecosystems are functioning. Uh, this scenario, this invasion process, really at the early parts of this process where uh, invasion is preventable. There's been a little bit of a focus on this, trying to identify species and, and highlight species that should not be moved around or that should be um, against. For example, Hawaii spends millions of dollars trying to make sure that brown tree snakes do not get introduced into, into Hawaii. Um, this is also why we have placed Nerodia on the restricted species list here in California to try and more transport and introduction of them into our state. And we see that established and spread, there might be still some chance of eradication, but it's too late to prevent the animal from having gotten to this new area. But then thinking about impact and integration, it's often way too late to do anything about the species. Instead, we need to think about adjusting our management in a form of on management going forward or maybe some kind of reconciliation and, and uh, awareness that the problem just isn't going to go away. Invasive okay. species globally cost quite a lot. And this is an older study now. This is from 2000, and it just focused on the United States. And their estimates were that we spend about $137 billion a year managing the impacts of, of imaging invasive species themselves. It was an older estimate from 2000. of that, stop it. No? The, the, except them. Okay, so when we look at the invasion process, and again, thinking about where all that money is being spent, $140 million in 2000, probably closer to $250 billion now. Dealing with these issues at the bottom, dealing with the impact, trying to remove non-native Spartina in the San Francisco Bay Delta area trying to uh, uh, print the broader spread of uh, non-native mussels, um, trying to deal with the impacts of lampreys, non-native lampreys in parts of the, of the Great Lakes or other regions. Generally, we're spending all of that money in the wrong place. We're spending money where it's probably not going to have a lot of impact. It's certainly going to have very little chance of helping us eradicate that species, but it might actually be necessary in order to make sure that we can continue to have some of the ecosystem services or, or functions that we want out of the habitats that we're managing. So objectives of the research that we've been doing in my lab for the last four years uh, are these three questions probably among others. The status of the introduced populations of these non-native water snakes here in California. So modeling to try and get a handle on what they're likely invasible range throughout the, the uh, North American West, but also specifically here in California. Some of those models, we've tried to get an idea of what risk these non-native species can pose to native species based on a lot of information that we have about their distributions here in the state. So that first, um, that first objective, we're going to focus on this stage of the invasion process, that is the one of establishment.
and it would be to know how, uh, what their status is, if anything has become of them, or in fact have become very well established since the the first description of uh, a few individuals in those those places. Southern water snake, Nerodia fasciata in Sacramento County, was actually the, stu the subject of a study from 2003 to 2004. If I recall correctly, I believe the funding for this was provided by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Uh, this was by Environmental Consulting Group, E Corp. And what was the study was that this population was extant, was established, and was actually reproductive. So you can see on the bottom left this figure showing the number of of uh, infants developing uh, fetuses in each of uh, the females that they captured. And the females were gravid, they were reproducing, and they were able to catch many of these um, males and females in this population at that time. So here's an example, um, well, not an example, here's a map overview showing you just where these populations are. So can you see the pointer here? just south of the Folsom Reservoir along a place called Humbug Creek that eventually flows into Lake Natoma. Uh, uh, zoom in area of that map in parts of Folsom. And this was a place where they primarily did a lot of the capturing and study, but they found a few individuals uh, just outside of this area. For the time, no individuals were found in Lake Folsom itself or in Lake Natoma. Another population of this species in Harbor City that was described in 2006 uh, had not received any prior work. And my colleague Bob Reed with U.S. Geological Survey and some funding from Fish and Wildlife Service actually had a, a study down there that began in 2010 where they trapped and removed as many of these animals as possible and studied their ecology uh, and the reproductive status of the animals there. You can see uh, them photographed here sitting on a, a floating plate. That that population was actually pretty reproductive. There were quite a few animals there. Uh, during the course of the study, they removed over 300 individuals. They we probably just barely made a dent in the population there. Those were quite large. You can see the size of the females here, over a meter in length. Uh, males being a little bit smaller, which is typical for all, all of these water snakes. And that many of these females here too were also reproductive and gravid. Here's a map showing you Harbor City, and this is actually Lake Machado down in Long Beach, California, and then a uh, zoomed-in view showing you the area where they were doing uh, the trapping in 2010. Here near Sacramento over in Placer County, um, we started work in my own lab in 2011. Uh, this uh, was the common water snake, the only population that we know of currently in California. 2007, and it had not been very well studied. We just knew that you could occasionally find individuals there. And so uh, this is if you basically go up I-80 and just head west a little bit, and it occurs on public rights-of-way property near a, a, a public high school. With thermal pools, we are occasionally endangered fairy shrimp as well. Uh, in the early spring, late winter of the population, you can almost see the high school in the background here in this photo, uh, uh, showing you that the, um, in this case, a lot of uh, aquatic primrose and water hyacinth growing everywhere. And using minnow, uh, minnow traps, they're basically funnel traps that we place in shallow areas or, or help them to float so the animals don't drown. We use these modified box funnel traps because we believe they might capture larger snakes than these uh, smaller uh, funnel traps. Some of the smaller size uh, individuals that we catch in a plastic minnow trap and in a metal minnow trap. And we started this work in 2011. We did 10 days of mark recapture. So we would capture the animals. We would give them a, a number code so that we knew who the animal was. We would release them and we track them for 10 days, looking at who we were recapturing and which new animals we were capturing. After those days, we started removing and killing every animal that we found because wisely, that was what California Fish and Wildlife wanted us to do rather than releasing these non-native species. Using the entire 57 uh, trapping effort, we can look at sort of a um, another way of estimating population size called a Leslie de depletion curve. 
rapidly, you have a decline in the number of animals you're catching as a reflection of your cumulative trapping effort. And then just because of the number of individuals that we removed. And then we're only able to sample about two hectares, given the number of traps that we had, but the entire area is closer to about six and a half hectares. model, the population estimate was that there were about 113 animals, but the range was from 72 to 250. The curve model, we actually got a very similar estimate of about 115 animals. And that, for the most part, we caught and removed 113 animals, and we were not catching any more animals toward the end of that study. So presumably, at least in that two-hectare part, we removed all of the ones that were being active and that could have been captured. <coughs> Density. Again, with about a two hectare study site, 6.2 snakes per hectare. One of the things that's been surprising about this number is that it is twice as many snakes in an area as we find for this species anywhere on the East Coast. Now, we get these kinds of estimates. There are only two or three of them available, but they only range closer to 25 to 30 snakes uh, per hectare, and we were finding more than twice that. Extrapolate outward just by simple arithmetic from the two hectares to the larger area that we were actually studying. We estimated that there were probably 348 individuals at that time. I see that with our removal of 113, we probably had some impact on the population, but we certainly didn't eradicate more than a third of them. And that um, all the animals that were large enough, of all the females that were large enough to be reproductive, 70% of them were reproducing when we captured them, meaning that they were gravid, uh, some of them very close to giving birth, others a little bit earlier in that process. The size was about 20, but we did find a couple of individuals up toward the high side of about 48 um, off their litter. Capture efficiencies. So we were capturing one animal with every 19 to 35 traps that we had set. This capture efficiency is a little bit lower than we get on the East Coast, and yet again, we were catching twice as many, uh, or densities were twice as great here. We at least some of our fears. We have evidence now that these snakes are feeding on native amphibians. Uh, in this case, this is not a species of conservation concern. This is a still widely distributed. Um, to use the word common, but it, it is certainly found this is the western or Pacific chorus frog, Sudacris regilla. So we have a few uh, water snakes that actually regurgitated or coughed up one of these when we were handling them. We found in this population that they were primarily driven by a lot of juveniles. So the figure shown here on the right, the upper portion A is the size frequency histogram of females the size frequency histogram of males. In white bars, we're showing you the frequency of animals in each of the different size categories for our study site in Roseville in Placer County. The dark columns are actually showing you a natural native population from the East Coast. And that we tend to capture far more juveniles, both of females and of males here in Roseville than you find in populations on the East Coast. And we suspect that might be because these populations are growing quite quickly. They are producing a lot of juveniles, and therefore there is a lot of potential for these animals to spread and disperse. That's operated by the fact that we had twice the densities of these animals here compared with um, native parts of the range. Is to try and get an idea of the status of current populations, unfortunately we found that the three most recently identified Occurrences of these species do represent established populations and that individuals there are reproductive. Again, three different populations, two different species. be removed. Our results are somewhat encouraging. We do have relatively high trapping efficiency. We can make a dent in their population in certain areas where we do set the traps. We see that we nearly eradicate them in the areas where our traps are. More traps to sample more areas if our intention is to actually remove them from broader areas. Capture a diversity of size classes ranging from juveniles all the way up to reproductive males and females. It was actually very difficult to catch some of the largest or oldest animals. They simply can't fit in our minnow traps or they don't seem to spend much time in our box fall traps. Most of those were from hand captures at some of our study sites. 
And it's actually larger, older animals that probably have the, well, they do the largest uh, litter sizes and actually be responsible for driving a lot of the population dynamics. So it, it'll be important to address those limitations and make sure that we can eradicate some of the larger individuals in these populations as well. Um, as I mentioned earlier, there are other objectives that we have been addressing with our research, and those other objectives focus these stages farther down, trying to get a handle on the potential spread of these species across California, as well as get a handle on the impact to native species. Now, we could do what most people do, just sit on our hands and wait until we see the impact and know exactly what the impact is, but I don't think that's very wise from a financial standpoint or very wise from a biodiversity and natural resource management standpoint. addressing these latter two questions, what is the likely invasible range of uh, for these water snakes across the western United States? But of course, uh, with this here, I'm focusing a lot on what's going on in California. And lastly, um, what risk can animals pose should they become more broadly established? It's a tool that's really grown in popularity and usage, has been really robustly identified. Um, as a useful tool and very rigorous tool that provides very credible estimates of where species can potentially occur, especially if you have a lot of data. And as I'll, I'll, I'll mention in a few minutes, we did have quite a bit of data. Distribution modeling, uh, I've essentially boiled it down to the main elements here. You need to have a lot of occurrences for the species. In this case, since we just have the two species that are known in California, the common water snake and the southern water snake, we get all occurrences that were published in natural history databases downloaded from several different websites, several different atlases, to every occurrence that we could of those different species. Model, uh, modeling effectively is to look at what kinds of environmental variables that best explain the occurrences of those species. If you have thousands of points where these animals occur, you can summarize and characterize the environment that those um, animals are being exposed to at each of those different points. Different factors, but what we ultimately found was that there were three environmental factors that really did the best job of explaining the occurrence of these species based on the records that we had. The rain temperatures experienced between the warmest and coldest part of the year at each one of those points, the, of the warmest three months at each of those points, and the temperature of the coldest three months at each of those points is you look for parts outside of the range of those species that match those three characteristics. In other words, we know animals can occur based on climate, so let's look for suitable climate elsewhere, and that's probably where these species can find suitable habitat. Now, like snakes, so we felt that it was very important to limit their potential distribution to areas that have supported uh, aquatic habitat created a GIS layer that was uh, actually a, a, a royal pain to pull together, but it includes a lot of information about uh, ponds, ephemeral streams, permanent streams, wetland densities, and that allowed us to sort of further restrict and restrain not just climate, but where is there actually aquatic habitat with appropriate temperatures for the two species. On the, the native distribution of these two species on the East Coast, common water snake is, as it's Applies, is actually far more widely distributed and more common. It ranges from the uh, fall line near the uh, Piedmont and the coastal plain uh, ecotone all up into Canada and westward past the Mississippi for drainage. And common water snake, as its name implies, uh, is more southerly distributed and found predominantly along the coast plain as well as parts of the Gulf Coast and slightly up into the Mississippi River drainage. So uh, there is some overlap between two of these two species in terms of where they occur. And you see that inside of the range shown here, we have occurrences using all of the records that we've found, and we also included the records here in California. So at the outset of this study, we had over 20,000 points that we could use to make these predictive models for common water snakes and about 5,000 for the southern water snake. Studies that suggest these models do really well if you have 50 to 100 points, and we're dealing with orders of magnitude more than that. So we have a lot of confidence in the veracity and um, accuracy of our models. Two or three different algorithms and trying to integrate that information about environment and aquatic habitat. 
to predict where the common water snake should occur. As you figure, all the very uh, red areas are areas that are highly suitable. And this model should do a very good job of predicting that it occurs where we do find it in the East Coast. And it tends to be the case. What they're interested in is what's going on here on the West Coast. And so you can see these areas again in red that show the highly suitable habitat, the uh, sort of beige color representing intermediate, and then blue where we do not predict very good habitat. Common water snake, the more northern, northerly distributed species, <clears throat> we have potentially a very good habitat along the coast of California, toward northern California, up into the Pacific Northwest, and along the foothills and, and higher elevations of uh, parts of California. In southerly distributed water snake, which is associated with warmer temperatures, does an excellent job of predicting where that species should occur in its native range. And then using some of the occurrences in California, we also find that it predicts suitable habitat in many parts of California, although predominantly in the warmer parts of California, the southern part of the state, and of course the Central Valley where, as we all know, it gets quite warm. So common water snake, we found that they typically have a more northerly distribution in the west, but they can also find suitable habitat in coastal areas. And into higher elevations of uh, parts of the coast and uh, Sierras. Sierra. Perhaps because it's associated with warmer temperatures, has a more distribution across the West, especially here in California, and is much more predicted to be widespread in Central Valley and other inland areas. of information and trying to integrate it with some awareness of the distribution of native species, especially those that are of conservation concern. Characteristic exercise and to get some sense of the validity of this approach, we're looking at several of the special status amphibian species, whether they are treated by uh, our fishing wildlife department as uh, species of special concern, or they're listed as endangered or threatened under state legislation or federal legislation with a handful of fish as well that we pulled out of the um, some of Peter's work in his assessment of the, the uh, conservation status of many of the fishes. All of the native garter snakes that, he, that occur here in California, because we know that they're likely to have to compete with these native species for resources, particularly prey, but also habitat too. What we did was we essentially asked, knowing the distribution of these native species, what is the likelihood that they overlap with some of those predicted ranges and the projections for these non-native water snakes that I showed you on the previous two, um, two slides? The next couple of slides are going to look very similar. In the what we're showing you is the suitability of habitat on the y-axis, the left-hand axis. Two parts of the figures, A and B, are the southern water snake expectations. The bars, C and D, are expectations for the common water snake. On those two leftmost uh, box plots, A and C, we have native garter snakes on the x-axis. right-hand side, we have several sensitive status, sensitive status amphibian species. The dashed lines are telling us that of that line predict high suitability for a water snake, a non-native water snake. Snake. These are telling us the distribution of the native species along the continuum of habitat suitable for water snakes. The black bar in each of those boxes is telling us where the median point is for the range of a native species. So looking in the top left graph, you see that Corpus gigas, which is the giant garter snake, actually has much of its habitat predicted to be suitable for the southern water snake. A lot of this box plot is above that dashed line, and also because the median plot for the native species lies above that suitability threshold for the southern water snake. That the San Francisco garter snake, all of its range is predicted to be quite suitable for the this uh, native introduced southern water snake. And look at the common water snake down in, in panel C. We see there are only a couple of species as well, but they are different species. 
at least in one case, we have the Sierra garter snake, Cali, and also have the giant garter snake, which has a lot of its distribution predicted as quite suitable for this non-native invader. Going to the panels B and D, this focuses on amphibians that are likely to be eaten by these non-native species. We see the Santa Cruz long-toed salamander in panel B. Narrow range, all range is, is expected to be quite suitable for region by the southern water snake, but not so much for the common water snake. We also have the California giant salamander has its habitat likely to be suitable for the southern water snake based on our projections. But then the other species, it's only small portions of their ranges that fall with these areas of concern. To look at a handful of the most highly imperiled fishes pulled out of the Peter Moyle's papers, as well as on the, uh, the right hand side, B and D, these are models of uh, steelhead. So we have, for example, the Klamath Summer Run KS, NCS is the North Coast Summer Run, is the Central Coast Winter Run, followed by the Central Valley Winter Run, the Klamath Winter Run, the North Coast Winter Run. Run also, and then the South Coast Central Coast Winter Run and SCCW. On the left hand side, we have a handful of species like the Lost River Sucker, uh, one of the cubs, actually the Delta Smelt, the Torch, the Cumbrook Lamprey, um, the Hitch, and the Sacramento Split Tail, among others. And what we see rather alarmingly is that for the southern water snake, many of these highly endangered in fishes are factors that are predicted to be quite accurate and invasible for southern water snakes. Southern water snake, perhaps more so than the uh, common water snake, is predicted to have a lot of interactions with steelhead. Um, thinking, how can a small snake like this eat a steelhead? Well, actually, Oncorhynchus mycus, the, the species uh, that, that, that's represented by steelhead, juveniles and their smolts are fed on all across the east coast in uh, the closely related species. And so we know that they're actually quite yummy prey at small sizes for these non-native um, uh, detail message from those figures that we just produced. The southern snake is likely to cause conflicts with things like the giant garter snake, federally protected, San Francisco garter snake, also federally, both of those state, state protected, Santa Cruz long-toed salamander, the California giant salamander, the delta smelt, the tulip, the hitch, the Sino split tail, and the Central Coast Winter Run, the Central Valley Winter Run, and the South Central Coast Winter Run populations of steelhead. Species that are likely to be affected by the common water snake. We have the Sierra garter snake, giant garter snake, which is in common with the uh, impacts predicted from the southern water snake. Instead of the cruise long-toed salamander, we have the southern long-toed salamander, the foothill yellow-legged frog, lost river sucker, delta smelt, uh, perch, Sacramento split tail, and only one population of steelhead, the Central Valley Winter Run. What's the point of these models? Well, and fishes that can prey are expected to be affected should we not do anything about these water snakes in our state. The, uh, some of the garter snakes, including two uh, distinct, very highly imperiled uh, native species, are at risk from potential invasion by these competing species. The concern that these two species can interbreed. So the distribution of the common water snake in blue and the southern water snake shown here in pink. Actually, a lot of overlap in where these species occur. Looked at the genetics of these species, they found that there's a lot of hybridization between the two of them. That the common water snake and the southern water snake actually used to be treated as one species before they were separated into two different species. And we do see a lot of gene flow between those species along uh, portions of their contact range. That is that if these two species are actually able to meet and think about how nearby they are in Folsom and Roseville, um, they could potentially have hybrid vigor or a much broader suite of genetic characteristics. They open up a lot more habitat for these two species and not just one species or the other. So this is going to be a cause for concern too.
two of the, uh, the, the main ideas that we're trying to address are how quickly do we expect these species to spread if they're left, un left unchecked, and to what extent are they spreading? Some idea about the potential for spread as well as the potential for impact, but now we want to actually address the likelihood in terms of the time frame for that spread and are they actually spreading. Distribution modeling effort, what we actually did was we looked at the known populations of the southern water snake in figure A uh, and the common water snake in figure B. And this said, where is that suitable habitat where watersheds are, are either adjacent to one another or have streams running from one uh, watershed into another? And so, does is it really kind of even finally constrains or restricts the potential distribution of these species? And it says, Given that you're not supposed to possess these animals and people should not be moving these things around, if they're just left to move on their own accord naturally, where do we expect them to be going? And see, as predicted by the model previously, southern water snake is going to be a largely um, distributed species, where common water snake is, has access to more northerly distributions, parts of the Central Valley, although it's often too warm for, for the species in areas, and foothills going up into the Sierra. That is, is looking at the time frame for movement from each of those various cells and watersheds. And to do that, we have to have some sense of the population dynamics. How quick the population is growing, how many surplus individuals are being produced, and their likely rate of dispersal from those known sources. We can the connectivity of waterway, which I just showed you previously, and we can initial maps of the potential rate of spread. So looking at each decade in the next 100 years, where could we potentially expect the species to start showing up if we do nothing about it? Uh, by Margaret, uh, I was working on some of these issues in terms of population dynamics uh, for these species on the East Coast before I took my position here at UC Davis. So that these animals can age quite quickly, that they can grow quite fast, and that they reach sexual maturity in, in some cases in as short as one and a half years. So I'm going to take data from populations that we've studied on the East Coast, as well as data that we've collected here on the West Coast in the last few years. And we're integrating those into a population model that can allow us, again, to really look at the rate of spread. So in just showing this map of connectivity, we have an animated map that shows the potential invasion front of this species. We really do a lot to help managers get an idea of when should we start worrying about these uh, native species making it to areas of high conservation concern where we have native uh, species at risk. For three years, we've tried to generate some interest in citizen science reporting. Um, we have an address that I'll show you later in this talk that you can send reports to. We really like it if you send in photographs. It allows us to really identify that, that you are, in fact, seeing one of these non-native species. For three years, we've had several reports from down here, uh, Manteca and Modesto. We have a report uh, actually by a fish and wildlife biologist uh, with an accompanying photograph of one Canals very close to Stone Lake's Wildlife Refuge while he was down there uh, some observations to try and limit impacts to giant gar snakes with some construction. Uh, we had um, a very popular fishing uh, spot further uh, south in the Central Valley, Little Potato Slough, where we had um, an unconfirmed report without a photograph. Lab with some funding from the Fish and Wildlife Service and the Center for Natural Lands Management has developed these molecular tools that allow us to test for DNA of of these species in the water. The test is often referred to as eDNA, which stands for environmental DNA. It says that, that we go out to these areas, because they're aquatic, you can sample portions of water, filter through uh, a sterile filter, grind filter, and extract DNA from it, and look for snippets of DNA that tell you that the snake was there. This has grown just in the last four or five years. My colleague Bob Reno is working on this with Burmese pythons, with brown tree snakes. Um, it's been really heavily used for a lot of Asian carp and aquatic fish non-native uh, detection. We're using it for uh, detection of very rare threatened species. Uh, the reason it's grown so much in popularity is because it's way more effective than just going out and trying to trap for animals. Those populations are still at very low density, which we often see is the case with newly dispersing non-native species and very rare species of conservation concern. This study, as an example, that came out of France and published in 2012, 
where they were trying to address this issue of the, the spread of uh, Native American bullfrogs in France. That if they just went out and did field surveys where they were looking for eye shine or listening for calls or trying to dip net tadpoles, out of the ponds that they sampled, the ponds that they sampled, they only found about 14% of them uh, to have bullfrogs. In out and took water samples and looked for snippets of that day, they found that 77% of them had evidence of bullfrogs. And this fundamental DNA usually gives you an indication that the animal has been there in the last week or two, so it's very effective in telling you what's happening now and it doesn't tend to give you much false information should an animal have been there years ago. So, either as members of the public, some of my students who I know are listening online, I hope are listening online, uh, or those of you who are fish and wildlife biologists uh, or uh, other members of other resource agencies who happen to be out doing um, work in the field. So, um, these water snakes are highly aquatic or riparian. With very little exception, you'll tend to find them either right at the edge of ponds and streams and wetlands and lakes or, or very close by. You don't find them very ones away from aquatic areas. The question that we know are established here in California, again, used to be treated as one species and have a lot of similarities in color and behavior. Um, they're often brown to brownish black, and they have cross bands. One is that these cross bands always start at the top and reach all the way to the belly of the animal. So they are a complete cross band. And that's in contrast to some of the native species I'll show you in a moment. They all have very large eyes, and those eyes tend to be set toward the top of the head more than a lot of our native species, which might be a little hard to distinguish. Uh, you can see again those cross bands go all the way down to the belly of the animal. And then the animal itself is often lighter and has alternating uh, marks that almost look to me like maize or a type of corn. Close up. Reaching to the belly of the animal, they flatten their head out as a threatening display, and have a triangular head. This is not to be confused with uh, rattlesnakes. So here's an example of a rattlesnake, which typically always has that triangular head. You know, the rattlesnakes, and this is just one you might find in some of the regions where you'd find water snakes. Uh, Northern Pacific rattlesnake do not have those splotches reaching down on the sides of the animal to the belly. Snake is the gopher snake, which does not have those bands reaching all the way down to the belly. They actually see in a lot of the same habitats are probably our aquatic native species, and those are largely the garter snakes. Our garter snake species have some kind of stripe that runs down them, although for those that have more brick like or blocky patterns, that, um, that stripe can be a little bit more faint. Generally, will never have those stripes, and they can see that these don't really have the cross bands that reach all down to the belly of the animal. If you find any of these water snakes, please do photographs of them. You can submit them with or with. You can submit reports of these with or without photographs. Be as precise as possible in describing where you see them, and send those to the email address californiawatersnakes at gmail dot com, and that gets gets distributed by a colleague of mine to a work group here in California. That includes federal uh, federal agency biologists, a few state agency biologists, uh, few academics uh, such as myself and others, um, and uh, actually a couple of environmental consulting groups as well. As I mentioned, um, some of this work moving forward that we're getting ready to do uh, has been funded by the Center for Natural Lands Management, who has potential impacts on giant garter snakes and a lot of their managed wetlands that are just 10 or 15 kilometers from the water snakes. U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, who funded some of the earlier work by Bob Reed and is funding some of our eDNA work here. here. Thank you guys, for your attention, I will take any questions. I think we do have plenty of time and uh, opportunity to be here. So, if you have any questions, I'll walk the microphone around, and this is so that the people on WebEx can hear the questions as well. And if anyone on WebEx who has a question, you can type it into the chat box and we will read it. Yeah. 
that's a great question that I should have addressed. These are non-venomous. They are to people. Obviously, they might affect us in terms of the biodiversity we value, um, but they can be bitey. Their bites are hard. I would say they're completely painless, but venomous species. So uh, no worries about threats to human health and safety. Regard. Uh, uh, fish and wildlife. Uh, what predators eat them? Um, probably, you know, probably the same things that would eat them on the East Coast. Um, the areas where they do currently occur tend to be relatively suburban areas. So we have things like raccoons that are eating them. A lot of birds of prey will take them. Herons will take them. The crows. Um, cats will take them. Um, Bobcats, foxes, any if, if those are present in any of the areas, they will all eat them. Uh, they generally get eaten by a lot of things, anything whose mouth they can fit into. But uh, predominantly birds of prey and mesocarnivores, mammals, possums, raccoons, feral dogs, pet dogs, and loose. Uh, Marling, you show both species of water snakes uh, be occupying most of Central Valley, mm -hmm. and the giant garter snake used to occupy much of that area, but is now mostly extirpated from at least the southern half. So is there anything about the water snake that you think is more robust and able to fill that area that the giant snake has now disappeared yeah. from? Um, this we're really keen on looking into, uh, and my graduate student is to some extent as well. We're partnering with a few people that, that do more extensive work with giant garter snakes to try the question, uh, what's different about the life history of these two species that one of them can be quite invasive and another one that seems outwardly to have very similar habitat needs and requirements, um, the giant garter snake, is actually doing quite poorly. Um, personally, this is a hunch. It's not supported by any data. I guess we would call it anic data. Uh, suggests that the population growth rates tend to be so much greater in Rhodia, reach sexual maturity earlier, and can start producing lots of offspring. Whereas giant garter snakes uh, take a year longer to reach sexual maturity, and only the very largest females produce off, uh, produce a lot of offspring in the giant garter snakes. So I think it's a matter of these water snakes can reproduce quite quickly have fast population growth, and that means they can withstand a lot of the kinds of pressures that we're seeing that affect all parts of the central valley. Whereas the giant core snake maybe isn't quite as resilient and doesn't have that capacity to bounce back from its populations quite quickly. But another issue that's, that's true to your question is that part of why giant garter snakes are doing poorly is because we have a lot of non-native prey that they're feeding on um, cause problems. So things like catfish, which actually end up killing a lot of giant garter snakes when they're eaten by them. Uh, we have uh, uh, bullfrogs, which will actually eat baby giant garter snakes and can actually cause some declines in giant garter snakes. And a lot of the species that are serving as prey for giant garter snakes are not natives and are from the East Coast. And get what these are from the East Coast, and they do a fine job on the East Coast eating them, and I think they'll do a fine job here. So, I'm uh, almost facilitating and creating the right conditions for water snakes at the cost of these giant garter snakes in some ways, just of earlier invasions that we've seen. Question Methods in more detail. <laughs> These kind of traps work quite well for uh, water snakes. They don't work as well for garter snakes. I know colleagues who work closely with giant garter snakes. Um, a lot of success using our kinds of traps, but we have great success using them uh, for water, both in the, in the East Coast and in the Southeast, as well as here. So we have a, a diversity of different sizes of minnow traps. We have plastic minnow traps. Occasionally, we've used mesh ones. Uh, metal minnow traps, tool and cut the ends of these minnow traps so it makes them a little bit bigger so that you can catch larger uh, water snakes, which often you want to do because the larger ones have larger uh, cause of babies. We put areas, usually in really thick vegetation, so that when a snake goes inside, it won't 
pull the trap down and drown the snake. Uh, you can also attach uh, floats to the outside of these, or sometimes you can just put a little piece of styrofoam inside the trap, which helps it float. Trap these snakes. Um, you'll also catch things like uh, gambusia, minnowfish, um, other fish occasionally, and we'll catch a lot of tadpoles, mostly bullfrog tadpoles, given where we're trapping, but occasionally other uh, um, other tadpole species. And we actually leave those in the traps because we know that it attracts a lot of the water snakes. And our trapping success seems to be much greater if there's something there for a water snake to eat. Now, we're not trapping in areas where we have endangered native prey. If we happen to find one of those, uh, we wouldn't leave it in there. There. And we also have to report it because we're not authorized for take on any of those species. But they generally don't occur where we where we do our trapping, which is why we haven't had any, any conflicts in that regard. These traps were something suggested to me by a technician who was working for me, Oliver Miano. He had a lot of success with these in the Midwest in trapping lots of different amphibians, as well as a lot of garter snakes in the Midwestern U.S. Uh, we find them to be quite as effective, but the premise is similar. You've got this uh, funnel-shaped opening, and you have a black silt fencing that's supposed to direct animals into the, the funnel traps. And, you know, the capture rates were about the same as the minnow traps, but these things are really cumbersome and heavy, and they were expensive and costly to make, um, and they were worth the time. For hand captures, a lot of times you can just go out and spend a day looking for them. And you can often be quite effective, although you have to be a little bit nimble and, and agile. Your graduate student is way better at that than me. Uh, perhaps he values his limb a little less than I do. Colors have gone out and tried looking for them at night with uh, very bright um, handled uh, uh, lamps. Um, and they haven't been too effective in doing that, but you can still catch them by hand at night as well. For you, oh, up on that, do you pre-bait the traps? We pre-bait the traps. Uh, you'll find that within a day or two, you'll have animals uh, prey in there, and so, um, and you'll actually even catch some water snakes usually the first day or two. Um, but we don't pre-bait them because they tend to fill up so quickly. Okay. We do catch a lot of crayfish in these uh, crayfish as well. Um, being a meal for my technician. I don't think they, uh, that they are eaten by the Nerodia for the most part. So we do toss out the crayfish when we capture them or take them and eat them. What all are available? Well, the reason we have this interest in population modeling is this question as to what kinds of effort are needed to really drive populations down and to have a negative impact on these species and their populations. Running these models yet, and we're getting close to having an answer to that. But uh, what we've seen in, in other species is that it's often catching the very largest females that drives populations. Uh, you can eradicate some of the larger females, there's a good chance that you can cause the populations to start declining and, and have a real impact on them. I have a colleague who, who's done some really interesting work and, and would really like to partner with us in snakes. He actually took male garter snakes, injected them with female hormones, basically an implanted female hormone, and that released the male garter snake. And that male garter snake no longer breeds because it's behaving like a female. And it also releases female pheromones, so it attracts all of the males to it, and it disrupts the mating system of the garter snakes. Now, I'd really like to see this um, studied a little bit further theoretically before it's tried, but one of the suggestions is that if you can can uh, earn the sex of every male that you've got by manipulating their hormones, not only are you preventing them from breeding, but you might be attracting enough other males away from females that you can drive the population to, uh, growth rate to negative. And so that's a pretty interesting thing to, to look at. Um, but I, I think in terms of control, getting a sense of where they're spreading and trying to remove them just by simple trapping as quickly as possible, as early as possible, would be worthwhile. With the uh, the work that was funded um, that uh, supported the environmental consulting group E Corp. Um, I haven't seen a lot of, of um, interest from many managers in actually trying to eradicate them yet. 
can you take the species with a scientific collecting permit if you find it during other research? You actually have to have a restricted species permit or have to have, as, as in our case, express approval from California Department of Fish and Wildlife on a scientific collecting permit. So I submit an amendment uh, and, and it's a better question for someone in um, the department for us is that when my uh, application uh, or I, I presume others could file an amendment asking to take the species on their, their current scientific collecting permit, um, you would need a restricted species uh, permit or approval. So the question is about their range. I'm surprised to see the extent of modeled suitable habitat in the southeast desert portion of the state. Please advise about minimal aquatic habitat requirements. So um, initially, when we were running these models before we included any of these um, aquatic restrictions, we the desert southwest, parts of Arizona and even parts of New Mexico and more of Southern California, was predicted to be suitable. Uh, based primarily on the amount of rainfall as well as the temperatures that occur there. And that's when we very rapidly realized that that's not going to cut it, that we have to have some measure of the density of aquatic areas and the, uh, somewhat the permanency of those aquatic areas. So, um, yeah, when you look at this, this uh, figure in particular, narrow regions that have uh, either more perennial areas like around the uh, Salton Sea or potentially around parts of the Colorado River, or some of the wetter areas that more predictably get monsoonal rains, uh, for example, near the state line with Nevada and California, um, that have areas predicted to be highly suitable. Much of the, rest of the desert regions don't have waterways year-round long enough uh, in order to really support these populations. Did you go back to Ro the Roseville site last year to see if the habitat was still available or the drought potentially dry it up? We were actually kind of worried. Um, we were invited to, to have an appearance on KCRA 3 here in, in Sacramento, and we wanted to bring in one of these water snakes to give people an idea of what they were finding. And we very reliably go out there and be able to capture the uh, since we started work in 2011. Last year, sort of in the midst of the drought, we went out there and much of that aquatic habitat was, was dried. Um, and there were only a few pools. The downside is that those pools had a lot of water snakes in them. And we were able to grab one by hand and, and show it on TV the next day. Uh, one of the other concerns is that with the dry down of, of these aquatic areas during droughts, we're worried that it might cause dispersal overland. So these animals are just going to start moving overland, looking for aquatic areas. There's no knowledge of golf course ponds in Roseville. Uh, in fact, we looked at some of those areas and a photograph of an animal from about three miles away from where we have been working in Roseville, and it uh, presumably would have crossed through some golf course areas to get to the, the ephemeral perennial stream that was dry last year after the draft was taken. Um, so, yes, that is shrinking. The animals are still there. Uh, it's it's relatively full right now, but we are concerned that it will dry down, so we're hoping to conduct a lot of our research in the next few months. Um, but the of those habitats isn't necessarily a good thing if it's causing dispersal to more permanent areas like on backyard ponds and, and golf courses. Uh, do you think that they can take juvenile pond turtles? Uh, question. Um, I think they take a hatchling pond turtle. That they would. The, the shoes are round enough, and these animals are gape limited. Uh, the snakes are gape limited. I'm not sure if they really could swallow it or not. Um, I wouldn't put it past them to try. Uh, the E Corp study addressed the topic of effort hand capture and cover boards, and hand capture hand capture is most effective. Yes. Um, Actually, they found pretty poor trapping success with very similar traps to what we were using. We followed up with them. Uh, well, we followed up ourselves at that study site and set the same kinds of traps that we've been using in Roseville. We set them in Folsom at the same study site where they had very poor capture success in the minnow trap. 
completely understood why. We had very poor trapping success with minnow traps there as well. And that's because the, the ponds where they occur are, uh, have very hard margins with not a lot of vegetation to place your traps in and not areas where the snakes are presumably foraging and spending time. There's a little bit more of a, a real discrete cutoff from the, the, the bank and then the pond. Um, but upstream and downstream from those areas, there are some more natural pools that occur along the creek that eventually flows into Lake Natoma. Uh, we had a handful of traps that were set there and did not catch many of the animals. Um, but we are anticipating going back there this spring to search for those areas with eDNA as we repeat uh, some of the trapping efforts. Uh, E-Corp was, was absolutely correct, and in our work kind of uh, supported that, that in that area, hand captures were far more effective um, and with the idiosyncrasies of that site. The species in Harbor City was easily catchable using minnow traps, and, uh, another, and, and we actually catch one, one per seven traps of that species across the southeastern United States. Uh, and the other species in Roseville, we catch quite easily with minnow traps. So I think it just has to do with what kind of habitat is available and where you're placing your traps. And the area in Folsom just doesn't offer a lot of opportunity to set uh, traps in a, a way that really are helpful to eradicate those animals. They require more hand captures in that area. Next question, which was, um, do you have any future plans for studying the Folsom population? Yeah, some of the work that we're doing that's related to the eDNA is to to DNA sampling at the areas where we know the populations are established, as well as in broadening circles radiating outward in waterways um, uh, nearby those those locations. After of these circles where we're going to be doing our eDNA sampling, we're going to pair it with trapping to get a sense of how effective trapping is versus eDNA because other studies do suggest that eDNA is more effective at detecting the animals. Um, that's going to be a subset of them where we're going to have traps. The majority of the sampling we're going to be doing will be eDNA. Our last question on WebEx is how successful has the eDNA detection been so far for these snakes? Uh, still working with uh, Pisces Molecular, uh, who is subcontracted in providing the uh, primers and probes that we're going to be using. Uh, it has proven to be quite effective in all other applications, and we are hopeful that we will have the same level of efficacy. Um, estimates are that it, it does uh, about an 80 to 95 percent job of detecting the species um, when the species is there. So not perfect, but far more than just um, trapping. throughout the Central Valley here. Uh, do you think that the snake will be able to use these as avenues to, to increase populations to other areas? Yeah, I, I, they will. Um, I would say the upside of these canals is that they're often denuded of vegetation. They're not, I mean, for, for reasons we like to keep them relatively clear of, of vegetation. So the, the good thing about that is that birds of prey might have a good chance of picking off some of these snakes if they're moving along those canals. Um, other than that, though, it's like a perfect highway for these water snakes. And, and that's part of the interest that the Center for Natural Land Management has, is that there's a real direct connection along um, all streams and also some of those canals to some of those wetlands for giant garter snakes. And they don't want water snakes where they're trying to restore populations of giant garter snakes. So some of the sampling we'll be doing for eDNA this year is actually every kilometer along a 37-kilometer continuum that starts with our Roseville population and runs along those kinds of canals directly over to where we find giant garter snakes. Are there any more questions? Thank you very much for your talk. Thank you all.